Welcome, folks. I'm Jabby Kawe, joined by Chara Kirk. What's up? We are watching Dr. Mike's Doctor Reacts to The Last of Us Medical Scenes. Now, I'm a big fan of Dr. Mike's YouTube channel, Dr. Mike himself. Big, big fan. I'm also a fan of The Last of Us TV show and the video game. And I thought, wow, worlds colliding yet again. I would love to watch that. I am anticipating that this is going to have a number of instances where Dr. Mike is probably being too overly medical and logical about things. I look things. forward to it. Um, I embrace it. I welcome it. You guys, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, bell icon, all notifications. Pretty please vote this up. Let YouTube know you're enjoying what you're watching. And before we move forward, I am fully anticipating comments going, a reaction on a reaction? Uh, I've never heard that one before. It's a reaction -ception. Uh, 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 uh. It's So much funny. I'm so clever. I've officially finished watching The Last of Us. I played the game, really enjoyed it, but there's a lot of medical stuff that we have to talk about. Okay. This is not just a live reaction. I plan this out into four categories of things we have to cover. This is going to be a wild ride. Let's get ready to have some fun, guys. Yay! He will. I this first this morning, aid. by the way. Like I said, this is the Use worst first aid. We got a couple of scenes here pulled up where I think there are just glaring examples of problems, starting with the first episode. Sir, we are not sick! Oh, God. It's distressing to watch this again. Okay. You're okay. Oh, no. All right, so she's breathing fast. That means she's not getting enough oxygen. So the body is responding by increasing the pulse, increasing cardiac output, and trying to increase the breathing rate to try and get more oxygen. Wow. So they got the breathing right. Yeah. So he's trying to apply pressure. This is the right thing to do in a scenario like this because she is breathing. She does have an open airway. But in reality, moving a person like this is now creating more harm than good because you're not actually helping them in any way. Baby. Baby, listen to me. I gotta get you up. Getting her up is only gonna make the bleeding worse faster. Given how much blood has come out yeah, in this but... short 30 second interval, you can already predict how much more is gonna come out. And as a result, no. you know that she's not gonna make it. That's why. It... Dr. Mike, you are not taking into account the whole situation. There's like freaking infected running around. There are army people that just tried to kill them. I'm sorry. At that point, I'm like, you gotta go. I think Dr. Mike is correct. You hold still, don't touch her at all. Take out all emotion, call 911 and wait. Everything will be okay. I understand that that is what you should do in that situation. That's what you ha should do. <laughs> I was going to say, like, that's what you have to do. Yeah. But then I'm like, that's what you should do. But context. I think we ha should keep watching. In a, in a wartime situation, if you were to see an injury like this, it would be about getting the morphine out, not helping the soldier. Oh, On yeah. This scene, Pedro Pascal should have got his morphine out. My guy doesn't know yet that she's bit. And he's trying to create some sort of ankle brace for her. But he ends up wrapping her foot like what are you wrapping here? like at least put something <laughs> stiff on either side of the ankle so it doesn't re-roll he's not Instead, a doctor he, like, double wraps the foot <laughs> like it doesn't help anything you gotta add the stability to the I ankle i love the way she when looks you have at an him inverted though. ankle ankle injury what ends up happening is you can damage the ligaments on the outside of your ankle oh, there you go usually the anterior talofibular ligament and as a result your ankle is very loose and unstable what i would have done is find some piece of wood like there's wood and materials oh. all around and take two little sticks and put it on either side of the ankle so that the ankle gets extra call stability. In fact, like some splint. of the best braces splint, yeah. that I recommend to my patients are ones that have like little metal inserts on the side that literally prevent your ankle from rolling side to side. Mm. It oh, allows your ankle okay. to have motion like this, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Right, so it's stupid Joel should have just went and got an ankle brace. Yeah. Duh. What's wrong with you, Go Joel? Go back into the museum. Get the stuff. Knock off some plywood and wrap yeah. it around her with the electric tape. Yeah, no. He's doing the best he can. Yeah. Boom. Wooden back gets hit, he pu pushes the guy, but then he's gonna realize the baseball bat that broke off on the tree is now in his abdomen. Yeah. Potentially the worst thing you can do is pull it is out. without thought, pull out the object that's been stabbed that's into right. you. You hey, keep it in there. object is jagged. So as a result, pulling it out is gonna create more damage, mm. just like most knives and other things that get inserted into you. On top of it, you don't know if it's putting pressure on a blood vessel and preventing you from bleeding out. And yeah. my guy right there pulls it out. Bad move. Yeah, Bad move. Joel. A lot of blood's gonna come out. He's gonna pass out. Yeah. And the reason why he starts passing out quickly is because due to the loss of blood, your blood pressure drops and you're not getting enough circulation to your brain, so you lose balance. Okay, she mm. found some thread. 
<laughs> well, very classic. At the very least, the reaction to the to the wound is is uh, realistic, right? Well, yeah, I think any of us are instinct when you've got a foreign object lodged in your body. I think I want to take this out because it doesn't belong there. Sometimes it's better to just leave it in there. I've watched enough medical TikTok to know this. Scenario here. Okay, she has this, first of all, extremely dirty towel, which is bothering me so much because she's just <laughs> festering that wound what? with massive bacteria. And then she's going to suture the wound. This is what I find ridiculous in these shows because remember, he was stabbed internally. So he's bleeding internally. Her <laughs> closing off the wound is only closing off for the bacteria to be trapped inside of there, right. not really stopping any bleeding because he's bleeding internally Ooh. from his intestines, his organs being damaged. So she's not helping him at all with a situation like this. She's closing a dirty wound, which is something we don't do. Okay, then she what got do you do, Dr. some Mike? penicillin. And she obviously doesn't know how to give him the penicillin. Also, this is an IV dose of penicillin <laughs> or IM dose I was of calling penicillin. That out. So Watch she just though. kind of ends up spraying it at him into his wound. So there's basically four ways you can give a medicine. You can give it orally. You can give it topically, like skin coverage. You could also give it IM, which you inject it into a large muscle group. Think about EpiPens. And okay. then last but not least, you can give it subcutaneously, which is in the superficial portion of the skin. Oh, and through an IV, obviously directly into blood. Like what if about I was hurt and I wasn't sure, I would probably just stab it in his butt. And I know that sounds funny, but at least that's an IM form of the dosage that you know it's gonna get well. When you say Stab it in the butt. Does he mean butt cheek? Butt cheek, yeah, because it's a big muscle. I just want to make sure. Yeah, because he was talking about intramuscular. You want to uh, get like a big muscle. Ah. Yeah. Absorbed and then travel systemically throughout the body. Obviously, doing it IV is the best way, but that's kind of hard to ask in a situation like this. Yeah. Joel is officially superhuman in this series. It starts with this scene. Yep, classic fight scene. He's getting hit. This is the worst place you want to find yourself in a battle like this because all the other person's weight is on top of you. You right. put pressure on these carotid arteries Dr. for Mike just is a matter a fighter. of seconds. That is the true. person loses consciousness. In fact, here's a strangulation reference guide from the oh. city of New York that says only 11 pounds of pressure placed on both carotid arteries for just 10 seconds is necessary to cause unconsciousness. I thought that it took much longer than this, but I love that there is a guide to how to strangle. I was thinking the same thing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and just four pounds of pressure on the jugular for 10 seconds is necessary to cause unconsciousness. That's because the jugular vein actually prevents outflow of blood from the brain. And if you block it, you actually have a buildup of blood in the brain, also causing a loss of consciousness. Huh. All right, so this is the part where Joel's running away. We're bringing the scene back. So, okay, he's fighting the guy, great. First of all, I already know he has a bat into him. But the fact that he chokes this guy for three seconds and then does this weird motion. This? This does not destroy someone's <laughs> neck. He doesn't even position him in a unique way. He moves his whole body around and somehow they create a cracking sound. What did he do? Did he crack his vertebrae? <laughs> did he crack his trachea? Even then the guy would be laying on the ground choking, but instead it looks like this guy just cut off all circulation. Just for people in case you want to choke someone out, this I learned in Krav Maga. Well, what he's doing there, he's got the guy's head in the crook of his elbow. No bueno. That's for TV. You know what I mean? Oh, so supposed to put on the yeah, it's okay. supposed to be on the forearm. Gotcha. Just so you know, in case you're ever in a it's situation. Really, he decapitated him with his ever mighty grasp on his neck. And obviously, off his fresh wound, freshly surgically closed by expert Dr. Ellie. He's fighting, wrestling people. My guy's hemoglobin hasn't recovered. He's still anemic. Walking for patients like this, they'll get short of breath. And yet my guy is wrestling out. He is super Like human, literally, yeah. there's a level of deconditioning that happens after an infection, after a blood loss, that you're not able to do things like this. I don't know any girl. Not even with adrenaline? Oh, this was an interesting scene. Basically, Joel sticks the knife, what looks like through the guy's femur and or kneecap and or tibia. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot oh. just, after being sick and anemic <laughs> and going into shock, with a knife, stab through someone's bone. And first of all, getting stabbed into the, the quad muscle, there's probably the most painful area to get stabbed. And there's so many nerve fibers, lots Ooh. of circulation, lots of blood Maybe that's why I'm loss. so ticklish wow, there. The fact that he just went right through his bone is impossible. Bye, Betty. 
Stun I, grenade! Oh yeah. These types of stun grenades create such a concussive effect on our brains that they shake us up. And in a scenario like this, where he was just injured, falling on his wound, not being fully recovered, he's not getting up from this for days. It's like getting the second- Dr. Mike, there was a time dilation yeah. right here. Yeah. He wasn't just recovered. I, I think I have to point that out, Dr. Mike. I'm pretty sure yeah, some time had elapsed. Yeah, some time had elapsed. Maybe he's not fully 100%, so I can maybe- so be moving that. like he is. Yeah. He carries Ellie out of the hospital. Yeah. I feel like several months of, or at least a month has gone by because it's gone from winter to spring. I think it had been at least two years. Most deaf. The second concussion in sports that I always tell you about is the worst. Ellie! And now he got hit again in the head. He's now waking up for weeks at a time. Not without major symptoms, at least. Next section is called Cordyceps is no fun, guys. It's my uh, little play on it. Because <laughs> it is a fun guy. Yeah, but it it's is. no uh, fun, guys. Uh, just to be clear, you, you do think microorganisms pose a threat? Oh, in the most dire terms. Fungi seem harmless enough. Many species know otherwise because there are some fungi who seek not to kill, but to control. It's actually true that fungi exist in the millions in our ecosystems, yeah. and yet there's only few of them that have adapted in order to evade our own immune systems, in order to tolerate the high temperatures that the scientist is about to talk about. Fungal infection of this kind is real, but not in humans. True, fungi cannot survive if its host's internal temperature is over 94 degrees. And currently there are no reasons for fungi to evolve to be able to withstand higher temperatures. But what if that were to change? What if, for instance, the world were to get slightly warmer? Well, now there is reason to evolve. I think it's important to think through these scenarios as scientists. I wouldn't present this as a leading threat to our lives because there are so many things like these mutations that could happen in certain scenarios that would be absolutely devastating to the human race that talking about it on a daily basis would just yield so much anxiety that would ultimately harm us <laughs> for sure as opposed to the chance of these things happening. I love that he's just like, okay guys, I'm gonna try not to get you to panic. Watching that again, I'm like, oh God, that sounds really scary and quite plausible. But these kinds of things happen all the time. I mean, before pandemic hit, you know, you had Bill Gates doing TED Talks and stuff like that yeah. about the possibility of a pandemic. I mean, obviously, you know, mushrooms is not anywhere near on the same level of threat as something that could create now, a pandemic. Yeah. Yet. Not yet. Do yeah, exactly. I mean? But like, but you do have people out there who are like very f sharply focused on a particular idea of right. what they deem is the next threat to humanity. So I can totally see something like this happening, but I wouldn't imagine that it would get widespread and whatever, whatever, because like obviously it didn't. That's why the outbreak happened because no one took this seriously after they just forgot about it. Sure. But also, I mean, if we're gonna die, you're gonna die. So may as well live yet life, YOLO. What was that? I don't okay. know. <laughs> Fungi can alter our very minds. Fungus starts to direct the ant's behavior, telling it where to go, what to do, like a puppeteer with a marionette. It's also true that fungi, technically most of them, would be weeded out by our own internal immune systems. But there are situations where our immune systems are weakened. That's actually the majority of times when fungal infections happen in humans, at least the devastating ones. And then on top of it, modern medicine has created some medications that we actually need to treat certain conditions that also weaken our immune systems that allow for opportunistic infections. Puppets mm. with poisoned minds permanently fixed on one unifying goal to spread the infection to every last human alive by any means necessary. And there are no treatments for this, no preventatives, no cures. They don't exist. It's not even possible to make them. I don't know why he says there are no treatments for fungal infections, because they do exist. So I'm sure he's making a point that I'm just not sort of wrapping my head around, but we do have medications for fungal infections. He's like, he's yeah. making a point that of cordyceps, like there's the last of us. That's the point he's making. The show, the setup, the premise of the entire show. It's it's just like bad, 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 now show. <laughs> Can you imagine like everybody's getting like athlete's foot cream and just trying to ingest it or something or like applying it on the infected? It's like, this kills fungus, right? Rub some athlete's foot cream on you. The one thing that I will say is accurate about this is they show the bite here and then they show little red bumps far away. These are oh. called satellite lesions and those are sort of part of what we see on a fungal infection of Ugh. skin. So that is realistic. Good. Take your bandage off. 
This is where we see her immunity. Joe. This is real. Joe, she's being real. <laughs> the question is though, how is she immune? Is it her blood type? Is it previous exposure? Some medication that she got? They have no idea. It's the cordyceps well, in her brain. this is Ellie being born. Right. We fast forwarded quite Apparently, a bit. Apparently, yeah. This scene also didn't happen in the game, which is unique. They kind of added a prequel of what happened before, kind of giving us some insight potentially as to how Ellie is immune. So you have a pregnant mom delivering a baby by herself in a really dirty, non-sterile <laughs> environment. <laughs> He's while like freaking out. Fungi infected zombies are running around. <laughs> Ooh, brutal fight sequence here. Yeah. You're also fighting for the baby. Yeah. We see that the mama bear gave birth to Ellie while fighting, probably from bearing down during a contraction. Uh -huh. You also see, simultaneously, that mama bear here has been bitten by said infected zombie. And mom is still connected via the umbilical cord to Ellie, therefore potentially spreading a small amount of particles of this infection to the baby. She cuts it rather quickly, but there is a possibility that Ellie was just slightly exposed to this type of fungal infection. So if you have a mild, small exposure of fungi that can't hurt you, maybe you could build up an adaptive immunity to yeah, said fungi. Yeah, vaccine. Not proven yet, but it's a theory. Now we gotta fact okay. check the actual medicine that we're seeing in the show. That idea had not been explored at all in the story because that is how vaccines were developed for a long time is you get a, mi a micro dose of the thing so you get kind of sick from it, but it's like your body's fighting it, right? Who's so going to volunteer for that? I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm like, that was never expressed in the show or the game as far as I know. I could sort of see maybe Fedra doing something like that. I would love to know if experiments had gone wrong with stuff like that. You yeah, know? that would be an interesting, like potential future place to go for the show if they wanted to do that, like show people doing experiments going wrong. Yeah. I'm exhausted. God damn it. Back in I bed. I promise you I'm gonna stay up. Why? Because this is my last day. What he's talking about here is basically medical aid and dying. For example, in New Jersey, where I work, we have programs that after meeting all the requirements, making sure that you've met with the proper mental health folks, that you've been judged by doctors to make sure that you actually have a short lifespan and that your condition is irreversible, that you can receive medical aid and dying. It's oh, part really? of compassionate care and end of life care. Frank looks like he probably has MS, maybe, ALS, also yeah, they never Garrick's overtly disease. Said it. They're actually quite yeah. similar neurodegenerative diseases, but the things that they attack in our nervous system is different. For example, in MS, this is an autoimmune condition where the body attacks the myelin sheaths, the protective covering of the nerves. In ALS, you're actually creating damage to the neurons themselves. So it's slightly different in that sense, but a lot of the symptoms look quite similar. Oh, this scene here is very fascinating to me because if Ellie believes this to be something that she has in her blood. Antibodies as an example. She's essentially trying to do like a covalescent plasma transfusion here. The question is, is she gonna create a proper transfusion kit? And as we all know, given the lack of supplies and the circumstances, she's gonna do the classic blood brothers thing or blood sisters thing where she's going to make an incision and try and bleed over his wound but as we know while that can transmit some infections it's not going to transfer enough healing factors for it to be beneficial and the reason we use covalescent plasma by the way for these types of transfusions like we use them with covid is because the plasma which makes up the majority of your blood it's that yellow portion of blood that i've shown you in ah. previous videos that we desperately need donations of so donate your plasma that's where the anti antibodies float. And by getting that donation, you can actually pass along immunity to others. Do you think it's possible that if we collect enough plasma, we can bring back plasma televisions? <laughs> Is that a different kind of plasma? Yeah, that's a different type of plasma. That well, was such okay. a dumb joke. No, it wasn't a joke. I was really trying to get back plasma TVs. Go ahead. This is where we learn this, uh, this community of people are actually involved in cannibalism. Oh, is that what that was? I'm joking. Not venison. What is it? Venison. <laughs> Many people will say, oh, that must carry so much disease. In reality, not to sound gross, human flesh is not that much different from eating animal flesh in terms of risk. You cook it well, the person's not sick in the moment. It's 
very similar. Obviously, the human body has a weird distribution of proteins and fats in order for it to be nutritious, so it's not very nutritious. But then the brain, what? it can carry a disease known as Kuru. And this actually was a big problem in the 50s and 60s in oh, New yeah. Guinea, where they actually, as part of their culture, would consume the brains of other humans. It's very problematic because it's lethal. And we learned a lot about prion disease from that scenario, and specifically a lot because the incubation period was so long that it actually allowed us to study it and see this develop in the native population. So that's wow. the one part of the body that's like a, a no-go. Just take me oh to yeah, her. Don't eat brains. I can't. Eat butts. She's being Hell prepped yeah. for surgery. But why is she going for surgery? What do they hope to do? If they believe her blood has healing powers, what is the purpose of the surgery? Study her blood first, see if that yes. works before putting her into surgery. This is one of those flaws in the story that I could never wrap my head around and I just sort of had to let it go. For right, the, yeah. It's like the point is the dramatic irony of it all. Like he's trying to get her there alive just so she can get killed by the doctors in order to save humanity. Jesus Christ kind of thing. Mechanics of it don't really matter. The point is in the story she needs to die and Joel has to save her. Yeah. Or like the, the that's the threat. It is frustrating though when you're like why aren't you going through all the appropriate steps? Why are you going jumping straight through? We need to cut her brain open. I mean if you really wanted to you could assume that they tried all that and it didn't work out. Sure. You know. Thinks that the cordyceps and Ellie has grown with her since birth. Why is she in surgery. It produces a kind of chemical messenger. It makes normal cordyceps think that she's cordyceps. It's why she's immune. That makes no sense. If it makes other cordyceps <laughs> think that she's cordyceps, they wouldn't bite her. He's going to remove it oh, from true. her, multiply the cells in a lab, produce those chemical messengers, and then we can give it to everyone. That's probably the worst theory of why she's immune. Whoever that doctor is needs to be relegated to the D League, the G League. Where do doctors go? I don't know. He thinks it could be a cure, Joel. Cordyceps grows inside the brain. How does he know that? How does he know that cordyceps grow inside the oh, brain, not in the blood, Dr. and then Mike. infect the brain through chemical messengers? It does. How does she know? How have they become experts in cordyceps when I don't know she about cordyceps? The only thing I know about cordyceps is there's something to do with caterpillars. That's my knowledge of cordyceps. And some people use them because they think it gives them like a better yeah. athletic performance. I understand if you fail doing all the initial tests and then this is your last thing, okay, fine. But they haven't even tried sampling her blood. Why not take a, a like a pint of blood from her, give it to someone who has a cordyceps infection, see if it heals them. This is a, actually a great situation to talk about the trolley problem. Do we sacrifice one oh, Ellie yeah. in order to save the human race? I'm curious. Leave your comments down below because I need to know. I know okay. If it works. How did you get in here? All right, so we see the heart monitor. We see good lights. We see them wearing proper protective gear. It looks like a very sterile environment, actually. Move! Oh my God. Please. They're taking off the EKG leads. They're pulling out the IVs. That was a weird placement for the IV. It was kind of in the middle of the forearm, not anti-cubital. I will say they did create a nice makeshift hospital. I just don't know what they were about to do. What medical procedure surgically would help them find the cure? I really like that. That was fun, yeah. Uh, he asked some good questions. Like, how the hell did they know all that stuff? We just kind of went along with it while watching it, right? Because it's like, okay, I guess we can buy into the fact that maybe after 20 years, they've kind of learned some information, maybe. One of the only stories that I'm aware of, whatever the Matt Damon movie was. Oh, The, the Martian? Martian? Sorry, yeah, The Martian. That's one of the only scientifically accurate science fiction films that's out there. As far as I know, feel free to correct me. The point in, in bringing that up is when you're a writer, you write. You're writing a story. It's yeah. all for the drama that is involved in telling your story. You cobble together a little bits of science here and there just to make your story kind of work. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're watching an Aaron Sorkin film, you, or, or show or whatever, you're not really concerned with what they're saying, like in terms of like the, the, the jargon and whatnot. Yeah. You don't have to know what it means. You have to trust that they know what it means. And so it's just about following the drama. The th that thread is the most important thing. And so the logistics of it, unless they're super glaring to even the most layman person, which in, in The Last of Us's case, I feel like sometimes it is. One of my favorite uh, authors, Charlie Houston, who talked about how he was writing a book about like a detective or something like that. And he borrows like little facts here and there to make his story work. There's a lot of fiction in between all that. And he 
got a lot of shit from like a cop or something like that who wrote into him going, oh, that's not what I would have done, you know, with my gun and blah, blah, blah. It's like, it doesn't matter. That's what this character had to do. Was it fun? Were you not entertained? Like, was it compelling at the end of the day? Yes or no? Yeah. And so obviously for someone like Dr. Mike, you know, he's going to watch everything differently than the way most people do. It's just, yeah. for me, watching him break this stuff down is just entertainment. Yeah, because like, I don't give a shit about most of this. And when it came to Ellie, even when I played the game, I'm like, what? Why do you have to kill her? You yeah. have to just let that go. It's an excuse so that Joel has to save her from this. And he's making a decision and that's what matters. Yeah, and it's also there so we can like question the morality and yes, everything exactly. like that, which makes us think and discuss and yeah. all of that, which is what art ought to do. Exactly, and at the end of the day, it's art. And so it's going to play with reality in a number of ways. And, and so it doesn't all make sense and that's fine. But yeah, like they're going straight for her brain <laughs> without even testing her blood. <gasps> to be fair though, the Fireflies are probably not made up of a collection of doctors. Everybody's a survivalist. Just yeah. the one doctor that he killed. Good job. Couldn't just knock him out. You guys, thanks so much for hanging out. Hopefully you enjoyed this. I'm Jabby Kawe. This is Achara Kirk. Peace out.